space with the entire Dini Nongo community. Welcome. So last week we talked about the bodies of the Buddha and uh, some of our brothers and sisters were in Glasgow, Scotland to represent uh, the Sangha in Thai city to those who are doing their best to try to change the situation of the climate crisis and this Sunday we listened to Thai Phap Yung and Thai Phap Lin as well as Sister Thay Nien share about uh, how to See that we are all interconnected, that the way we um, live on this planet is affecting how others live, not only people, but plants, animals, and minerals. And uh, that it's possible to transform our anxiety and fear around the climate crisis. This is uh, why Thay's teaching is so essential. Uh, fear can paralyze us and we feel we cannot do anything so it's important to recognize that that feeling of fear and anxiety is impermanent possible to change our way of living, change our habits, change our mind. And that gives us hope that this is possible. Just that we come here together, we decide to come to the monastery, to live simply, live in community, eat together, walk together, play together, and water the seeds of joy together, then we know it's possible to do it. That because there's no other way except doing it together. <laughs> Even we have all kinds of perceptions uh, about each other. Even we, uh, we cause each other to suffer, but somehow we have to do this together. <laughs> so thank you for your practice. Thank you for being a model for the, the world. Just Doing this practice um, now, like we learned in the the, the, the Dhamma body of the Buddha, we have the precepts body. <laughs> we're here at the monastery. We're practicing to uh, not to kill, not to steal, not to yeah, engage in uh, sensual misconduct and so forth. And we have the concentration body, concentration on emptiness, signlessness, aimlessness. We get the insight that we are not a separate self. And that is the topic of this class, <laughs> the 23rd tenet. We can talk of a person as a continuous and ever-changing stream of 
fine aggregates. The five scapandas. The stream is always flowing. It is in connection with and interchanges with with other streams of phenomena. We cannot speak of a person as an unchanging and permanent separate self. about uh, the three Dharma seals, and we already covered that a few months ago. Uh, impermanence, non-self, and nirvana. And so non-self is also a kind of concentration. For example, when we look at this body, we see that this body is made up of the earth, the air, the water, heat, and if you take out the earth, and the water, and the air, and the heat, then you don't have anything left that it, you can call yourself. This is me, mine, myself. Another way to look at it is with the five aggregates. Body. Feelings. perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. So we talked about how in in realizing that this body is not me, I'm not limited by this body.
So we have the tendency to think this body is me. But actually this body is just a, um, an aggregate of physical processes, processes, right? So we have water and air and earth and fire, elements like carbon and uh, oxygen, nitrogen, all coming together, flowing, cells combusting the oxygen we breathe in through our mouth and, and this wondrous uh, interchange of fluids, of air, of heat is constantly uh, changing, constantly catalyzing chemical reactions in our body and wherever we look in that body we cannot find a cell or some thing we can call the conductor. It's like an orchestra without a conductor, I like to say. <laughs> There's this beautiful music that is happening in the body, like a grand orchestra, but no conductor. And that is not for the point of, uh, of um, feeling like uh, sad or lonely is for our freedom. <laughs> it's actually a, a, a great freedom. Usually when you think about yourself, you feel a little bit sad. <laughs> There's some kind of attachment that comes in. This, you start to think, oh, yeah. Maybe you think, you look at your hand and you remember when your hand was you were just a child and you think, oh gosh, you know, I have all these scars on my hand. It's getting older, wrinkles. <laughs> and uh, you, you miss that idea you have of yourself as a younger person. Or if we see the body of another, like our mother or our father, getting old, passing away, and then we start to, to feel sad. We think, oh, that self, my mom, is, is, I'm losing her because you don't see that she's in every cell of our body. We are the continuation of our mother. We are a stream that has flown, that, that, is, uh, that is flowing from the womb of our mother into the present moment. And so the insight of no self is not for the purpose of negation, but for the purpose of realizing this wondrous existence, this wondrous uh, experience of awareness and not grasping onto anything. So when the Buddha talked about the five aggregates, he talked about them as the aggregates of grasping. Upadana Kanda, Upadana Skanda. I think uh, I shared about this. These are the, um, it means the aggregates. Skanda is like some. Actually, this uh, it has um, you can look, you can think of it as a as a tree when it branches go off that kind of mass where the, you have uh, branching off of different things, right? So we have body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, consciousness. It's, these different aspects of our experience in every moment that we try to grasp onto as me, myself, or mine. And then when we believe this to be me, and if that changes, we suffer. So the Buddha used an image of, uh, as well, like a, a river, and a man in a boat, he's going down that river, and there's reeds, and um, grass, and um, we can say cattails, <laughs> uh, 
And as he flows down that river, he tries to grasp at the grass, but it just pulls out. <laughs> and the same with the reeds, the same with the cattails. He tries to grasp onto it, but it, he cannot. And he just continues to flow. So that is like the present moment, always flowing, always changing, always uh, in motion, not fixed. And yet, in our thinking, we want to make something fixed, something that's me, mine, or myself. And so we, we try to grasp at the grass on the bank of the river, but we cannot, it just comes right out. The, the, the flow is too strong. And, uh, and we, uh, we ourselves are also changing as the one flowing down the river. <laughs> so, it's just a metaphor. Tai talked about the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. He said that no, a man cannot step in the same river twice. You cannot step in the same river twice. The river is always changing and the one who is stepping into the river is always changing. <laughs> so the one who steps in the river as well as the river are not ever the same. There is nothing fixed and that was a, uh, an insight that he had. Uh, that had an influence on Greek philosophy. And all of this is a, what we call a concentration on non-self. So reflecting on the impermanence of the body is a concentration. It helps us to, 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 to let go of the block, the blockages in our consciousness. We just shine the light of mindfulness somewhere where we feel, oh gosh, maybe you're thinking about someone in your life and you're having a difficult relationship with that person. Your whole day you might have arguments, arguing with that person. You feel sad because of what they said, what they think about you, what they feel, and you continue to just water that seed, but then you realize, oh, that's because I'm caught in an idea of myself. <laughs> I just continue to, it's just that person, they said that thing, and you have that perception, and then you continue to believe that you yourself are that thing that they said that they did. So the deeper practice, I find, is to go and look and see what is actually my experience in the present moment. And I see, ah, if I continue to, to dwell on those perceptions that that is myself, I feel sad, I feel lonely, I feel cut off. But if I come back to my breathing, come back to my body, not grasping, just aware of the breath, aware of the body, just breathe, Breathe out and smile. So it's just the body, just the breathing, and joy can manifest. <laughs> there can be the possibility of joy just by breathing, no longer giving attention to that perception, that continual, mm, yeah what that person thinks, or what you think they think about you. <laughs> I do, I practice this very often. Even as a monk, uh, living in the community, actually we have, we can have a lot of perceptions about each other. <laughs> and we live together, and we work together, and, yeah. and so I've learned that uh, I can always learn from the perception that someone else, something they say or they do, but I don't have to believe entirely what they are saying because they are also suffering. So I get in touch with their suffering and I also try to look how my, I have contributed to that suffering. And then from there, 
I can change, I can change my behavior. So that is an empowering way. <laughs> it gives you the key to changing, to opening the door to a new possibility. And if I just continue to dwell on that perception, then it just becomes like a, like a merry-go-round. You just keep going around and around and around and around and around in the same argument <laughs> in your head. And meanwhile, you're watering the seeds. It means you're stimulating your hormonal system actually to generate a feeling of fear, anxiety, sadness. So, and that has very little to do with what the other person. That's just in your own mind. <laughs> That's what you're doing. So, the practice is making the choice to generate a feeling of joy, to let go of grasping at that perception. And so, the purpose of the teaching on non-self is not to try to negate uh, who we are, right? It's not to try to uh, say that we don't exist, right? So don't misunderstand. It's for the purpose of letting go of our grasping. Obadana is this grasping, this energy of grasping. I think I told the story uh, of these group of monks that were practicing uh, to look at the non, the impure aspects of their own body in order to let go of their attachment to their body. And they, were, they saw they're still attached to their body and they're also attached to the beauty of another body. And so they heard this teaching of the Buddha, which is to reflect on this body and the not so beautiful aspects of the body, like the mucus and pus and saliva and blood and intestines and excrement and all these things, which are also wonderful. <laughs> but the, sometimes when we look at a person, we think about the if you're really like, attracted to someone, I invite you to reflect on their bowels and their excrement. It's very helpful. <laughs> you see, oh, just behind this wall of skin, there is also, <laughs> you know, just like everyone. And so that helps you to get less attached, right? You know, if, you're, if you're kind of obsessed with that person, their face, or their whatever. <laughs> So they were practicing this, but they, they grasped it the wrong way and they thought, because I have a body, then I can never be happy. And so I, in order to, to change the situation, they, they actually like, committed suicide. And the Buddha heard about that and he, he, he had to give a very strong teaching to his students. The teaching of non-self, of the impurity of the body, is not to reject the body. It's to let go of our grasping at the body, to see that this is an ever-flowing stream, and you cannot grasp onto it without causing suffering. So, just practice letting go. So, non-self is the practice of letting go. And If we continue to somehow deep down have this idea that we are a separate self deep down inside of us, there will always be some kind of blockage, some kind of subtle grasping that is making us somehow suffer. <laughs> and that's what, the, that's what the mindfulness practice helps us with, I, I find it. I mean, this is a kind of like a, I mean, it's a meditation, right? It's a way of cultivating the mind to just let go, to go, and we say go with the flow, right? <laughs> but you need to let go of the flow. Don't try to hold on to it. Just see whatever it is in you 
that continues to grasp. And then you train yourself in your sitting meditation to attend to those things which are there and are clearly impermanent, like the breath. So that's why we start with mindfulness of breathing. Because the breath is, you cannot say there is a self in the breath. It's very, um, it's very obvious that nobody gets caught in the thing. The breath has an identity or a self, right? And so from that starting point, then we can start to apply it to our body. And we see, ah, this body is always changing. And what I think of as me is also changing. And so there's nothing permanent. And then we continue with feelings. We see, ah, okay, pleasant feelings. They come, they go. And then we just let them. Unpleasant feelings, they come and they go. And we, we let them flow. And then the same with our perceptions. We say, ah, oh, these thoughts I have every day. I wake up, oh no, the same birth, thinking about that person, thinking about you know, the, those words, those difficult conversations that we've had. And, oh, and we suffer. So just let it go. And the same with our mental formations. Our anger is impermanent. Thank goodness. Imagine if our anger was permanent. <laughs> So, we don't repress the anger, we fully recognize it. So just like Heraclitus stepping into the stream, the stream is, is there, it, but it's a continuum. And sometimes we are in the rapids, and it's frothing, right, with white water, and then it becomes calm again. So the practice is not to deny that sometimes the water is uh, turbulent. So when anger is there, we fully recognize it. We, we let ourselves uh, shine the light of mindfulness on it so that we can see and understand why is it angry. Just like when we look at the stream, we understand that uh, there's more slope in the course of the riverbed and so the water has to flow more quickly, and it is not as deep, and so it passes through the rocks, and it's very agitated. And so the same is true of our anger. When we look into the, the anger, we can recognize it, accept it, and, and, and hold it, hold it in the light of mindfulness. So we talk about embracing our anger with mindfulness for the purpose of understanding, ah, these are the causes and conditions, these are the perceptions, these are the feelings that I've been holding onto, that have brought about the conditions for this anger to manifest. And also we can experience the feelings that come with that anger. Are those feelings pleasant? Are they unpleasant? And then by letting go, then the anger becomes less we no longer grasp. So emotions like anger, s despair, there's some kind of grasping underneath that. There's something that we don't want to let go of. And that is uh, <laughs> our body, our feelings, our perceptions, mental formations, and even our consciousness. Like in our awareness, there's we want to be aware, like this my I am aware of my eyes, my ears, my nose, tongue, body, and mind, and I want to, and I think that awareness is me, but I know that that awareness is impermanent. <laughs> that this uh, awareness will also pass away. And uh, if my eyes become damaged, then uh, my the visual consciousness that I think of as me experiencing the world is not there anymore. <laughs> I realize it's dependent on my eyes. The same for my ear, my nose. So that's Thai often invites us to get in touch with the wonder of being able to see in the present moment, being able to see all the millions of colors, 
faces of our friends on the path. <laughs> Not for the sake of grasping, but for the sake of really recognizing the wonder of the present moment so that we can fully enjoy it while it's still here. <laughs> and then we feel if we go blind, we can still be happy and joyful because we've really enjoyed our eyes while they're working. The same is true of our body, our legs. We have two legs that can walk. So enjoy <laughs> when you can walk. Like going on the gatewalk today. Walk down to the, in the moonlight. And it's such a wonder. Not everyone has legs in good working condition, but those of us here, we are able to walk. And so we can enjoy our walking. Um, just these simple things bring so much happiness. <laughs> so enjoying in the present moment what's going on allows us to let go of our grasping. So enjoy your good health. But you know that it's impermanent. And then you're free. <laughs> so the way to not get caught in this idea of um, nihilism or annihilationism, like these monks that try to kill themselves to be free, is to recognize that there is a continuum. There's a flowing continuum of, of this body, of these feelings, these perceptions. They're not just random. It's not just uh, random events happening. There's cause and effect. <laughs> and so how we keep our perceptions in the present moment, they will affect, that will affect how our Feelings, for example, maybe in the future. What we attend to with our eye, consciousness, ear, nose, tongue, that will have effect, an effect on our perceptions in the future. So there's a continuum, there's a relationship. And that continuum is usually what we call a separate self. We make the mistake, we think, because there's relationship, there's a connection, interchange between one thing and the other, that there's a permanent separate self. And that is me. <laughs> Maybe we can listen to a bell. When I finished university, when I finished college, I felt so, mm, I felt trapped. <laughs> I had this degree, but actually I felt, uh, I felt like I was in some kind of prison. And many of my friends, they were getting jobs, some of them in, finance or going to graduate school or and I had uh, 
I had the, my, my parents had gotten divorced and I was asking myself, like, who am I? <laughs> like, who? I want to know. I mean, yeah, getting a job, these, making money, but what, what's the point of all that if I don't have a clue who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing? And so at that time, I just wanted to uh, step out of the, this, this stream that I felt trapped in, this, this high velocity, um, uh, these high velocity rapids that I found myself just coursing down to step out. So the only thing I could think to do is to leave the country, okay? And so I, I went and I, I lived with a, a friend in, in Ireland and ended up getting a, a job teaching English in, in Spain. And I just, uh, I didn't have an answer, but I said, okay, I want to step out of this, this stream, this, this crazy stream of a career, and, which I knew was not going anywhere. <laughs> and. Uh, Yeah, and I met many teachers, sometimes just on the street, <laughs> asking myself this question, you know, who am I? And I learned, without calling it that, this teaching on non-self. <laughs> I learned how many people there are out there who are doing kind things, good things, for themselves, for others, without putting a name on it, without having a title, without having a salary, without having a, 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 a resume or a curriculum vitae, right? About all the kind things they have done, the compassionate acts they have done to themselves and to others. And so I wanted to go deeper into that uh, that space and just go with whatever, uh, whatever happened, <laughs> which can be dangerous also, especially if we don't have a, like a mindfulness trainings. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go too much into it, but I got involved in activism and I was living in squats and in Paris and, and just uh, getting like a, the leftover bread from the bakery, <laughs> going dumpster diving for food, uh, getting whatever's left over at the market and living together with young people who are living like that. And I just, I just wanted to go deeper and deeper, just letting go of any idea of myself almost like self-negation in a way. I didn't, I didn't have this practice yet, but somehow I, I knew that the story of myself is not true. I can tell myself many kinds of stories, and ultimately none of them will be completely true. They're only just approximations. And at some point, uh, after a few years of living like that, I. Uh, I came back to the U.S. and I was um, <laughs> after four years of university and then maybe three years, something like that. Like I had to live with my parents for seven years and by now my mom was uh, divorced and living by herself and she's a wonderful person. She's just one of the most amazing moms. But it was so difficult to be a 20, whatever, three, 24 year old who's living on their own and coming back to suddenly live in his mom's house. And the idea that my mom had of me was not somehow in conjunction with the reality that I had been living. And I could not explain. <laughs> and so I felt this kind of deep cognitive dissonance and, and I could not go to see some of my old friends. I, could, I felt some kind of shame, like I could not explain this experience. Now I would call it experience of non-self. 
of becoming free of my idea or the idea which is imposed on us by our community, by society, by the way we look, the way we talk, the way and so forth. Um, and what we, we, we do. And so for many months I, I ended up in a depression. I actually felt, uh, mm, I was so angry. I was angry. I didn't, I didn't want to get a job because I didn't want to have a car and a house and a family and kids. <laughs> All these things that are just creating, exacerbating the climate crisis. <laughs> this, is, this is like 19, around 2000. And, but I didn't know, how can I, what can I do? What, what kind of way of living can I, can I embark on that is not going to just contribute to this crisis that we are living on the planet Earth? And so, the best I could do was just to go for walks every day in the forest. Luckily, my mom's house is in the forest near the river that I grew up on. It's, she had moved to a different house than the one I grew up in, but not far away. And so I would just go for long walks in the forest every day. And I didn't know much about meditation at that point, but uh, I had my, my dog who was quite old, it's a beagle named Pepper. <laughs> Actually, I, I felt after that one dog, I, I, I don't think I can ever have a dog again. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had a dog that's just so wonderful, then you feel like we can't possibly <laughs> have another dog like that. Anyway, I'm a monk, so I, I can't have a dog. <laughs> it makes it easy. <laughs> And I always remember one day that I, I was so confused and so angry and, and I didn't have anyone that I felt I could uh, communicate what I'd been experiencing to. And it, was snow, it had snowed, so there was snow everywhere and I went for this long walk and many, many miles away from the house on the road. And the, my dog Pepper, he had a, like a radio collar and the, there's a boundary around the house because he's a beagle and they, they love to wander. So, and then my mom had put this collar on him to keep him from going out of the yard. And I must have been t maybe three miles away from the house and suddenly he came run running up behind me and I'll never forget that moment because I was so alone, I was so angry, I was so confused. And it's like he, yeah, maybe I exaggerate in my mind, but it, I felt like he had taken that pain of running through the, the shock of the radio fence the, because he knew I was suffering and he wanted to be there. I don't know. <laughs> But that's what I, I felt in that moment, and yeah, it's just this great companion that just uh, helped me through this time, this difficult moment, as my mom also did. But then I went to a yoga center and I saw people meditating for the first time, and I just was able to sit there for 20 minutes or whatever, we would, we would do different kinds of yoga, but what I remember is just sitting there, following my breathing, and suddenly just saying, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know, <laughs> I really don't know anything, actually. I know, two, I know lots of things, but I don't know anything that's, but I can follow my breath. I can sit here, that I can do. <laughs> and I found people who I could talk to, I could explain what I've been going through, and they listened and they understood, and I thought, oh my gosh, where have these people been? My, you know, 
everyone I talk to, they just say, well, have you, did you get a job? Did you do this? And suddenly I felt, I met, I remember this couple at the yoga center and I could explain what I'd been through, what I'd been living, this experience of non-self, I didn't call it that, but of just letting go of the story that had been given to me by my parents, by my community, by my education. And uh, I felt understood. That was so important. <laughs> and so I, I said, okay, I'm going to learn meditation. And uh, a little bit later, I went to, a, I think my mom heard about a, a Buddhist monastery nearby. There were not many monks or nuns there, but it had a big Buddhist statue. There's a Chinese temple. Actually, it's close to Blue Cliff Monastery, if you've been there. I think it's Chunghua Temple, something like that. And next to the Buddha statue, they had a little book that was called the Four Arousings of Mindfulness, <laughs> which we call the Four Establishments of Mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta. And it was in English on one page and Chinese on the other. And I thought, I took that booklet, it was free, and I memorized it. <laughs> I said, okay, this is something I can do. It's not just philosophy for the sake of thinking. Try to think through suffering, it doesn't work. <laughs> This is inviting me to come back to my body and just sit there, follow my breathing. And I don't have to think about anything. I don't need to solve any problem. I don't need to impress anyone with my deep thinking. I just need to be aware of my breath, aware of my body, aware of the movements of my body, the position of my body the impermanence of my body, and the same of my feelings, my mind, and all phenomena. And it was suddenly joy manifested. Just sitting there, aware of my breath, my body, my feelings. And I would do, I would sit for 30, 40 minutes, I would recite the entire uh, Satipatthana Sutta in 40 minutes in my, my head mentally. It's a little bit strange, but I was benefiting. I felt I saw myself, I saw my mind changing so quickly and growing. It's like this sustenance, kind of food that I, I had been missing. And, uh, and I, it felt like my body is glowing with joy and happiness. And so that, yeah, I can say within a few days, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a Buddhist monk. I wanted to live the Dhamma and that's it. <laughs> and so that's what I've tried to do until now. <laughs> you know, not, not focusing on anything. I don't need to attain anything. I don't need to have a title or a position or even be a very good monk. But I just do my best to practice the Dharma and to learn the Dharma deeper, to understand it. Because the more I do it, the more free I feel, the more happiness, the more joy. <laughs> so that is a, yeah. A, so that self that I uh, found myself crashing back into, coming back to, uh, coming back home, literally coming back to, to live with my mom. It's like, uh, I saw that that, it's not that the self that I left behind when I went to get rid of it, or the non-self that I tried to realize living outside the country, that either of those are wrong, it's just that actually it's the grasping. It's the, this idea that I need to have a story, that there needs to be coherence to this self, rather than just this wondrous experience of, of 
this. <laughs> this is the suchness of things. It's already enough. I don't need to have a story. <laughs> Even that story can be told many, many different ways. That's just a, it's just one way of telling the story. Just like all of us, we have so many, we have unlimited ways of, in which we can tell the story of our lives. It's because this is always changing, it's always growing, and our way of looking is always changing and growing. And as soon as we've told the story, it's already past. <laughs> it's already changed. So, uh, so seeing this as a stream that's always flowing and growing. So coming to the monastery, practicing, the reason we have the working meditation, we have sitting meditation, we have walking meditation, sleeping meditation, is to give us a space, and an area where we can, no one's going to pressure us to be anything. <laughs> we try to set everything up so that you don't have to be anyone. And we don't do it perfectly. <laughs> we try our best, but yeah. even as monks and nuns, we still have our perceptions and we still you know, are on the path. And that's why I always have compassion when I feel hurt by somebody, something they say or do, I think they're also on the path. <laughs> I'm on the path. And I don't expect them to be perfect. Sometimes as practitioners, we expect everyone else to be perfect, but every, we expect everyone else to understand our, our shortcomings. Do you ever notice that? Like, you know, very quick to say like how that person's not practicing non-self or they're not kind or compassionate, but we, we expect everyone else to understand when we're angry or unkind, or, right? So, uh, yeah. So the, the practice center is there for us just to, to practice to be a stream flowing, to not have to be anything in particular, to not grasp on and actually, when we realize that continuum happening in every moment, we see that we're intimately connected and interchanging with everything that is, everything else in the universe, <laughs> with the air, with the sun, with the earth, with uh, the bacteria in our body. There's a, yeah, we no longer have that artificial, conceptual separation of this body or these feelings or these perceptions that we create with our mind that cuts us off from the rest of the universe. We just, there's an ebb and flow that's constantly happening. Maybe we can listen to another sound of the bell. So the Buddha taught that there are three wrong views concerning the self. So the first one is that the body or the feelings, perceptions and 
is the self. It means the skandhas are the self. The five skandhas are the self. So I think I've covered that pretty well. So that's for the, if we have that wrong view, we think this body is me. When the body changes, then we suffer. <laughs> and it's always changing. And the same is true of feelings, perceptions. We think, oh, I'm a mindfulness practitioner. I should always be joyful. And yet we are sad. And we wonder, but that sadness doesn't, it doesn't fit with my idea of who I am, right? Myself, right? So, but, that's because we have a wrong view about the self and perceptions. I'm always a kind person because I'm, a, I'm practicing in the monastery. So then when we hurt someone, we cannot accept that we've hurt them. We think that they've done something wrong. They need to practice. It can't be possibly me that has contributed to the situation and so forth. So this is the first, so that when we say wrong view, it means it's a view that brings about suffering. <laughs> if you hold on to the view in any way that the five skandhas, this body is me, then there's suffering. The second wrong view is that uh, the five skandhas are different from the self. So we, we take the view that, okay, I, I can accept that this body is not me, mine or myself, and these feelings are not me, mine or myself. But there is a self outside of the body, feelings, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. So there's some kind of uh, metaphysical entity that is outside, which then goes from one body to the other, to another, or so forth. Like a simplistic idea of reincarnation. And, and so, in, it, somehow that self is not affected by the vicissitudes of the five skandhas of the daily life, right? But, if there is this self outside of the five skandhas, is it, can we be aware of it? And when we are aware of it, then isn't it consciousness? <laughs> or a mental formation? Or a perception? So when we create an idea of the self, right away, it becomes part of the five skandhas. <laughs> because we have a perception about it, we are aware of it, we are conscious of it, and we have an emotional response to it, feeling, right? And so, there's nothing outside of the five skandhas, actually, that can experience the self. So actually, it becomes just a, a mental formation, a construct of our mind. Do you, does, is that clear? 
Is everyone not clear? <laughs> right, once we, we have an idea like, okay, I can accept that none of these five things are myself. So then with mindfulness, I try to see where is, so if it's not this body, if it's not these feelings, if it's not these perceptions, not my emotions or mental formations, it's not consciousness itself that is the self, but something somehow other that is permanent, unchanging. All these things are changing, but there is something, some thing that is not. Then we, we will tend to grasp at that thing. We want to understand it, we want to touch it. And for, but that thing can, if, if, it, if we touch it, if we are aware of it, then already it changes. <laughs> it has entered into contact with the impermanence of all things. <laughs> you see? And so we see that actually there's nothing there. <laughs> there's no conductor. Let me give an example. So Thay often um, would use to talk about the phrase, the wind is blowing. But now I ask you, If there's no blowing going on, where is the wind? How can there be wind without blowing? So what sense does it make to say the wind is blowing? So the same is true of the five skandhas. So if we talk about this self, which is somehow outside of the five skandhas, which has body, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, consciousness, well then, what is that self without the five skandhas? <laughs> this operating of the body, of the feelings. The same could be true for the rain, right? We say, the rain is falling. And so I would ask, well, if the rain is what sense does it make to say the rain is falling? If it's not falling, it's not rain. <laughs> so we can just say rain, and we already know there's falling going on. And the same is true of the wind. When we say the wind, there's already blowing going on. So there's no, the very definition of the wind is blowing. <laughs> it's just like the rain is by nature falling. And so there's no rain, just like there's no self that is existing outside of the operation of our body, feelings, perceptions. You see, if you take away the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, consciousness, then what self can there be? Just like if you take out the falling, how can you say it's a rain? Or how can you, if you take away the blowing, how can you say that it's wind? <laughs> So this is a kind of um, trick that language can play on us. We talk about a self and we attribute qualities to that self. And because we're attached to it, we can accept that these things are all impermanent, but we want something else to be there that's outside of all these impermanent things. And so the Buddha taught there is the unconditioned Nirvana, right? That is uh, going beyond the conditioned world. But that is not something you can call a self. So we mistake Nirvana sometimes for a self. The unconditioned nature. Which cannot be grasped. It can only be experienced. So we have to be very careful because we are attached to this present moment 
and we keep grasping, then we create a self. When actually, it's just the unconditioned nature, which is not a self. <laughs> it's free from anything, anything you can call any kind of quality. So we, we don't want to mistake that there is something outside of these five skandhas that is somehow the self. And then the third one. There is this, uh, that there is a self in the skandhas or the skandhas are in the self. So the, the self is not the five skandhas, nor do the five skandhas belong to the self, but that they are residing in each other. gives you a headache. <laughs> They're all just convoluted ways of trying to uh, keep our attachment to a self. <laughs> so instead of just uh, letting go and seeing that this is, it, all of these are just a stream, a continuum, and that our experience of the present moment is not outside side of that stream. We feel like we need something permanent, a separate self. And so we try to say that the self is in the five skandhas. It, it, we already accept that they are not the five skandhas. We accept that they are not different from the five skandhas. So then we say, well, there's a self in the five skandhas, or the skandhas are in the self they are somehow mutually within each other. So this is just, again, grasping. It's just kind of attachment. We just want to put the self somewhere. So we miss the point, which is that this teaching is not for the, sen the purpose of description. It's not for the purpose of philosophy or establishing some kind of um, existential relationship but it's for the purpose of helping us to become more free and happy. <laughs> when we see that the body is impermanent and is free, it doesn't have a separate self, then we are no longer attached. We become less attached to the body. We become less attached to our feelings and perceptions. And so for so long as we try to keep putting this something in there, this is always something that we try to grasp because we, we want to arrive at the self. <laughs> Like I said, in my own story, I want to understand, who am I? You know, what am I doing? What am I supposed to do? And actually, that, that question, as, for me as a young person, progressed. And so, first I said, well, who am I? Well, I could say, I'm this name. I was born in this place. I, you know, I did these things. I have these friends, I like to study this, I don't like to study that, I like to eat this, I don't like to eat that. But ultimately that's all just conditioning. So it's, I think for me it's more helpful to go along and say, well what 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 do I what should I do? What am I what do I need to do? I found that much more helpful. It's like, even if I know who I am, I still won't know what to do. 
And that's when the Dhamma was so helpful. Well, I can do this. I can practice the Dhamma. I can try to, un I can follow my breathing. I can practice impermanence. If I don't know what to do, I can do that. And the more I do that, the more I become free, the more I feel joy. So I want to keep doing that. <laughs> and so I don't need to, I don't need to try to look, go searching within these things to try to find myself. And I don't need to try to put these inside my idea of the self. Does that make sense? <laughs> so it's, uh, so we, this teaching on the wrong views around the self is for the purpose of freedom. And non-self is also gives us the insight of impermanence. And when we see things as impermanence, we see non-self. So these two concentrations are going together. And just to finish, When we talk about a continuum, we also see it as a, like points of light, a person who is standing holding a torch. turning it in a circle, right? At any moment, the torch... You like my picture? <laughs> at any moment, the torch is at one point. But we know in the darkness, if you've ever seen somebody who throws fire, the appearance is like a continuum, a circle. So when we look deeply into consciousness, we see that actually it's just made up of instance of consciousness. And that's uh, for our freedom, because in every moment you can change. You can decide not to say that unkind thing. You can, do, you can say something compassionate. You, dis you can decide not to water the seed of anger. You can come back to your breathing. Water seeds of joy. If you see that at every moment, there's an opportunity to change. So if we continue to believe in a self, we think that this circle of light is one permanent entity and we cannot change. <laughs> There's no chance for impermanence to happen. And that is why we get stuck in our thinking about a self or myself. So, meditation, mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of consciousness is for the purpose of seeing these instants of consciousness and making a change, deciding, seeing that this, it's possible to train our mind to go in the direction of kindness, to go in the direction of love, to go in the direction of peace and not to continue to take the path of anger, of fear, of jealousy. So this is how the teaching on non-self is a deep um, training in Buddhist psychology, in healing and transformation. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>